good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to St Paul's Covent Garden, the Actors' Church, for this memorial service for Clifford. It, I do a lot of these, but it really is a great honour to, uh, to remember here somebody who was actually a founder member of the RSC. I mean, that's, that's quite a statement, and uh, it's, uh, it's good that you've come to the Actors' Church to celebrate and give thanks today. Um, we think inevitably, of course, today also of uh, Dig Lender Jackson, of course, who, who died yesterday and obviously worked, worked with Clifford. Now, I'm sure he has gathered round him today people from all faiths and, and perhaps from none, but uh, if it's within your tradition, I invite you now to join with me in a prayer. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Today we come together to remember before God our brother Clifford, to give thanks for his life, and to comfort one another in grief. Father in heaven, we thank you because you have made us in your own image and give us gifts in body, mind, and spirit. We thank you now for Clifford, for what he meant to each one here and those listening around the country and around the world. As we honor his memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift, including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We stand to sing our hymn, Lord of all hope. Let us pray. 
Merciful Father, hear our prayers and comfort us. Renew our trust in your Son, whom you raised from the dead. Strengthen our faith that all who have died in the love of Christ will share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Do please be seated. <clears throat> a reading from the first letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. For where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. <clears throat> when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only as a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now. I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. My friend Lynn, who ran theatres for many, many years and was in charge of uh, the programmes, she came to the conclusion there was no such thing as a perfect piece of print, because however many times you proofread it, there would always be a mistake. Unfortunately, Ian Hogg, who was to be our first speaker today, has been unable to attend to, to family sickness. He's very disappointed uh, not to be able to be here. But in his place, Peter Gale, who was a dear friend of Clifford's for over 50 years, uh, will read extracts from Ian's tribute. Uh, the full transcript of which you can read on the memory table at the back. And there's also some amazing pictures and, and things at the back. So do join that at the end. Over to Peter. Ian has entitled his tribute, The Golden Olive Tree. I first got to know Clifford as a friend during the run of Peter Brook's acclaimed production of the Marat Sad, which played at the Martin Beck Theatre on Broadway in 1966 for six months. I found New York a mad and lonely place. We were lunatics acting out Dessard's vision of the reign of terror during the French Revolution. While in the real world, outside the theatre, the madness of Vietnam stalked the streets of Manhattan. One afternoon, my sightseeing took me into the crowded 42nd Street bus station. It was seething with lost people, an outer circle of hell. Then, straight ahead of me, completely out of place, I was am amazed to see a, a Greek deferner full of men smoking and staring out at the traffic. The host of the place, who was standing at the door, waved at me to come in and sit down. I did, and had an afternoon 
of laughter and company. The taverna was called the Golden Olive Tree. Several weeks later, I met Clifford on his way to the stage door and invited him to have lunch with me. I was interested to see how he would react. When he saw the smoke-filled interior, he hesitated. But the host greeted Clifford and me and ushered us in. Clifford relaxed and we talked and talked. He was so easy to talk to and he listened so well. Lunch break at the Golden Olive Tree became a regular event. We continued to meet for lunch over the next 50 odd years. Always a welcome lunch break. Thank you, Clifford. Rose. What an actor. Wow. I first met Clifford in 1991 when rehearsing the Thebans for the RSC. 
I was struggling with the priest of Zeus. We called him Zeus. He was supposed to be Zeus, but it was Zeus. A one-speech character with a long black robe and a silver disc stuck on his head. Clifford was playing Tiresias, the blind prophet, with at least six two-page speeches to contend with. Struggling, he was not. Clifford stood center stage, head aloft, listening to the birds as he declared with crystal clear clarity their prophecies. Cool, calm, unruffled. I watched and listened and was in awe. He was inspirational. During a company meeting in 2000, Adrian Noble asked Clifford how far back he went with the Royal Shakespeare Company. We learned from his reply he'd been a founder member of Peter Hall's inaugural company of 1960. I was only 14 at school in the third year. Wow. I knew Clifford's face from the black and white telly. Among other parts, of course, was that Nazi commander, powerful, vicious, steely-eyed. Was this the same actor who was now playing Worcester and calling me Brother Northumberland? Wow. In the late Stephen Pimlock's production of Richard II at the other place that millennium year, I had the responsibility as Northumberland of supporting Alfred Burke's dying Don of Gaunt into the wings after his royal throne of kings, this set to dial speech. Halfway through the season, Alfred, you may remember, has a brain hemorrhage and is whisked off to hospital. The other place, of course, is an understudy free zone. If an actor was off, they were replaced by an available actor from up the road at the RST. Clifford was free that night, and at short notice, with book in hand, gave his rendition of John of Gaunt, thereby saving the show from certain cancellation. Alfred was not expected to return for some months, so for the next performance, the next night, Clifford joined us again. This time, Less than 24 hours later, he was off the book. Lines learned, perfect iambic pentameter. A performance so flawless that no one would have believed that he had not been a part of the production from the first day of its 12-week rehearsal period. Wow, what an actor. Later from the stalls, we witnessed Clifford's hilariously drunk Lepidus in Michael Attenborough's production of Antony and Cleopatra at uh, the Haymarket. The only time I've ever seen him drunk. You know, I'm not even sure he ever went into the dirty duck. The perfectly timed comedy of the judge in the chalk garden at the Don Mar was hilarious to behold. And won, as we know, Clifford the uh, Clement Derwent Award that year. And we were thrilled, but not surprised, when Michael Boyd awarded Clifford the status of RFC Associate Artist. Free ticket for press night, and about time too. <laughs> Clifford and I met up regularly, both living in Stratford, whether it be at our place, Clifford's place, or the other place. Usually, it was inside Carluccio's in Waterside. We talked of theater productions, old and new, the many he'd been in, and those we felt we should have been in. We talk of directors we admire and of the few we... <clears throat> Clifford's praise for others put me to shame. His enthusiasm and energy put me to shame. How can someone who has survived in this business for so long, despite illness and personal tragedy, saying goodbye to Celia, his wife, cast cynicism aside and still retain the drive, the passion, the desire to continue to be available. Maybe if we'd just had one or two more lattes in Carluccio's, Clifford might have possibly revealed the secret. I miss Mr. Rose. I looked up to him. What an actor. Wow.
Thank you, Christopher. Is that near enough? To, yeah. Okay. On, on hearing the news of Clifford's death back in November 2021, these words came into my head. A knight there was, and he a worthy man, that from the time on which he first began to ride abroad, loved chivalry, truth, honour, courtesy, and charity. He was valiant, he was wise, and in his manner modest as a maid, and never a discourtesy he said in all his life to those who met his sight. He was a very perfect, gentle knight. Chaucer's gentle knight and a somewhat suitable description of Clifford, although the horse is metaphorical in, the, in this case. And I apologize for quoting Chaucer rather than Shakespeare, but I'm sure Clifford wouldn't have minded. Or if he did mind, he wouldn't say anything, just smile in a slightly abstracted way. But the Canterbury Tales is apt for two reasons. The memories of Clifford's qualities, and because we both share the first in Canterbury. It was my first professional job in theatre as a set designer at the Marlowe Theatre in 1969, and it was Clifford's first touring date with the RSC slightly few years before that. My father went to school in Worcester, as did Clifford. There was no overlap in either circumstance, just coincidence. A coincidence, too, that we both ended up living in Stratford-upon-Avon, less than half a mile away from each other. I still often drive past Clifford's house on my way into town. It always prompts fond memories. The first time I saw Clifford on the stage was again in Brooks' production of the Maritzard at the Allwoods Theatre. Both productions, of course, had Glenda Jackson in them. Like Christopher, I was still a schoolboy, uh, and when I saw the film version, I was an undergraduate, but still. The re recollection of that production haunts me still, but in a nice way. But between that first time of seeing him on stage and the last time we lunched together, I had the pleasure of working with him fairly regularly during my 10-year stint as a BBC Radio Drama Director. Not as often as I might have liked, perhaps, but frequently enough to experience just how good an actor he was. His distinctive voice was well suited to radio, and his thoughtful punctilious performances were always commanding. I remember Pythagoras, a play written by Danny Absey, better remembered perhaps as a, a poet than a playwright. His brother was the MP Leo Absey, you might remember him too. Anyway, Clifford, in this case, was to play Pythagoras. The part was a, a big mountain to climb, full of complex emotional and intellectual twists and turns, and the writing was poetic, not at all naturalistic. I remember the author, Danny Absey, turning to me after the first read-through, whispering, bloody good, isn't he? Sounds like he's been playing the part all his life. Pardon the Welsh accent, but, but he was good. Bloody good. A few years ago, I came across a postcard from Clifford, dated 1970-something, thanking me for a recent part we'd done together on, on radio. He actually took the trouble to send it from the States when he was touring there with the RSC. It was one of the many thank you cards from Clifford that I found tucked in a book. When I showed them to him, Clifford was highly amused to find I still had them after 40 years. In the 80s, we both became involved in various TV series, sadly not the same ones. I was the uh, first director, in fact, to use the new look Covent Garden just outside for a, a Bird of Prey location, a series starring the wonderful Richard Griffiths. And Clifford, of course, was in Secret Army with the equally wonderful Bernard Hepton, and then in Kessler with, well, Clifford. <laughs> we bumped into each other from time to time, often on the London train, but we didn't regain close contact until about 15 or 16 years ago when I was added to his formidable list of lunch dates. We would mainly, though not exclusively, talk about the latest RSC offerings in Stratford, I also accompanied uh, my wife, who was the mayor at the time, to the, to the press, uh, press nights which Clifford went to. As most of you will know, Clifford held 
quite firm opinions and was not above writing a stern letter to Greg Duran, the artistic director of the RSC, if he didn't much care for what was on offer that night. <laughs> Equally, he was most appreciative, as Chris mentioned, when he did like something. In 2016, on the 400th year anniversary of Shakespeare's death, Cliff and I sat and watched Peter Brook's 71 film of the Schofield Lear in the Picture House in Stratford. Afterwards, I listened in awe to Clifford's lengthy analysis of the differences between the stage and the film performances of Schofield and to the whole production. He remembered in clear detail after a gap of around 45 years some of the most particular differences. The film was a starker version of the play and um, this was to do with the fact that Brooks' thinking was influenced by the shadow, as, as was mentioned in Ian's piece of the Vietnam War during that period. Clifford indeed was in Tell Me Lies books, anti-Vietnam War play. But he, hadn't, he wasn't actually in the Schofield Lear <laughs> on the stage or on the screen. An awesome memory, though. Sadly, there'll be no more lunch dates but the stories and the memories will linger on. Clifford was a wonderful actor, a wonderful lunch companion, a person anyone would be proud to call a friend. He made my life better for being a part of his. I hope that I was able to give back a little in return. As mentioned, being one of the original company, Clifford often recalled events from his own time in the early days of the RSC, the plays he was in, the actors he worked with pretty much everybody. So I think it fitting that I take my final words from the writer whose plays were so dear to Clifford, Mr. William Shakespeare, again, once a resident of Stratford. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Goodbye, my friend. Sleep well. Now, I have good news and I have good news. Uh, the good news is there is actually a, a little celebration with the bar at the back after the service. So on this beautiful hot summer's day, uh, you can have some refreshment. So there's some good news. First, struck by 
lots that were said, but I was particularly struck by a 12-week rehearsal period. I mean, inconceivable now, isn't it? Here we are, a much richer country than we were then, and yet we can't even do that now anymore. But there we go. And I do miss, don't we all miss the old other place? It was so, so much better than the new one, but there we go. Um, well, you're on your feet. Um, we've had some beautiful... Uh, speeches, uh, but none of you have applauded because you think it's rude to applaud in church. But this is the Actors' Church. These walls need cry out for applause. So for all our reasons, but especially for Clifford, let's give him a standing ovation. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God seen in Jesus Christ. Grant to us, Lord God, to trust you not for ourselves alone, but also for those whom we love but who are hidden from us by the shadow of death. That as we believe your power to have raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, so may we trust your love to give eternal life to all who believe. And so may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rests upon you and all whom you love and care for in this world and the next, today and always.